the point of a startup is to build what money can't buy. It's to like add a new capability to the human race. I feel like tech has gotten away from its roots a little bit of like true technology, transformative edge of possible shit. We've started to think about it like, oh, tech is software and like tech SaaS. is Google, Google is SaaS and Google Nails and force. companies that are now like decades old and it's full of like MBAs doing B2B SaaS shit. And Horrible. like, no man, tech is, tech is like nerdy scientists in cargo pants and like New Balance sneakers, like reading papers and hacking on shit and doing things that sound insane and impossible that actually... You know, as, as Balaji said, I made it the first chapter of the book because I think it's one of the most important ideas, like building what money cannot buy today. All right, welcome to another episode of Not Investment Advice. We've got the NI boys here today, Jack Butcher, Trunk fan, Bilal Zaidi, but we've got a very special guest, Eric Jorgensen. Welcome to the show, mate. Thank you for having me. What's up, guys? This is Eric, it. This is... What's your nickname? I need to know. Does anybody ever call you Jorgie or was that the first one? <laughs> Dude, you, you actually got it. High school, I was Jorgo. And then my first company was Viking. Those are my, my big two nicknames Viking, of life. there we go. Buddy, now that's just talking. standard, right? You take the first syllable of a guy's last name and you add O or Y. That's just how it goes. <laughs> o or Y, Jorgi or Jorgo. Come on, man. This is Wait, just- Trump, so what was yours so then? You're Fano? Fanny? 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 No, they, uh, <laughs> no you'll, you'll actually laugh. They, uh, well, funny enough, every Vietnamese guy and probably a lot that you know, what do they do? What are their names? You take a white person's name, you add Y. Timmy, Johnny, Jimmy are the most like popular whiteified oh. Vietnamese. Name. Think about it. How many Jimmys do you know? Who's the most famous poker player that's Vietnamese? Scotty Nguyen. Why on top of Scott? Um, I got another thought. Sorry, guys. I'm absolutely wired right now. <laughs> I know, I know Nothing Jack new is wired too. Jack wrote before. I mean, the listeners are going to love this. Jack wrote uh, last night that, <laughs> Jack, what did you say? You got a shotgun, Kirkland Cold Brews? He's, he's on it right now. I was up last night watching the charts, boys. So I had to have a heavy in <laughs> yeah, yeah, injection yeah, yeah. this morning. <laughs> I knew I, mean, I was coming on this podcast. I beer bonged three Red Bulls, snorted a lot of Skittles <laughs> so I can keep up with Tron, man. You got one of those hats as well. You can do it yeah. while you're playing games. Uh, by the way, I have to say I'm doing a terrible job here because we didn't even introduce you because we got a meme in a week. We got lots to talk about. But Eric, you're on the show today because today is the launch of your new book uh, that you and Jack has also contributed to the book. So it's a perfect day to be recording this. Uh, it's the anthology of Balaji. And I went back to episode zero of our pod here when it was still a trial. And we talked about Balaji in the first episode. So long time listeners oh, will know yeah. we've been talking about Balaji's ideas since the beginning of time, essentially. So, uh, yeah, we're going to go into some of the ideas from the book <laughs> and that wrong. process. But, uh, yeah, <laughs> he's just cracking up already. Okay, hold on. How, wait, can, we just, uh, can we also talk more about uh, uh, Eric's new job? Because let's just get this out of the way now. Eric, you got a new gig, man. It's a big yeah. deal. <laughs> Pretty wild. This is a big deal, man. Can you tell yeah. people what your day full time job is right now? Yeah, I like accidentally acquired a new job, which is CEO of Scribe Media, which is the company that published the Almanac and Naval and now published the Anthology of Biology. So I'm like my own I'm CEO of the publisher that I'm the customer of as an author, which is a wildly convenient thing to be. Um, it is kind of a crazy story, but it's an awesome company. The team's amazing. I'm a, I'm a huge believer in like this method of publishing, um, which a lot of people don't appreciate, like how the traditional publishing industry works. But um, yeah, that's, that's I added another job. Um, so more Red Bull. Okay. So we'll, we'll definitely talk more about that uh, afterwards, but I know Bilal wanted to start this episode with something that had to do with a certain price of a certain asset. That yeah, many no, of I don't us know which one, but uh, <laughs> yeah, here's, on let's go meme how, of the week for this. How boys. are your bags feeling? Are they heavy or the light classic. at the moment? <laughs> Here we go. Well, boy, I mean, there's only like a few people watching this on YouTube, but this is the meme of the week. We got a crypto boy sitting at the Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving dinner table. And it's obviously Prince Charles, aka King Charles, living his best life. We had a few more here. I think uh, Jack wanted to share this one as well. Michael Saylor going ham after Bitcoin hits new all-time highs. Trung, how long are you going to be standing for? That is right. the question. So Eric, I don't know if you know the running joke, but I'm, I'm supposed to be standing on this podcast till 69,000 and then it went down to like, I guess, 20. <laughs> he got tired. I'm, the, I'm like, bro. <laughs> He's very clearly point, sitting right I'm now. I'm thrown in the towel. Like, <laughs> no, but uh, I was actually messaging with Jack yesterday because I was such, so late to the game and then just as a total loser, I was buying, I was buying GPTC at like 
65,000, 69, the total top, right? <laughs> like every After every podcast episode, I'm like, it was so jazzed up in 2021. I'm like, oh, let's get more. So I need this thing to hit like 46,000 for me to break even. Just to break even as well. Just to break even, man. Well, people forget you were called Fiat Fan for a long time on the pod. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That was, just, and then you bought your first Bitcoin live on the Well, if you watched show. like episode 12, you saw, you saw the conversion and oh my goodness, man. What was I thinking? But anyway, so why don't we rattle off some of the big news, which is uh, contributing to the pump right now? Go not not investment advice. Drunk. For the love of God, not investment advice. <laughs> no, I don't even know the news. D- Wait, so Trump what is, is it? is our resident lowercase j journalist. So, okay, no, I mean- so what... What is the Go news? On. Hit it. Hit me. I don't know no, the news. I mean, we're all, we're all, all the running joke is that everyone's old crypto WhatsApp and Telegram groups were popping off last night all of a sudden. Everyone's been hibernating and you start seeing some memes roll through. <laughs> you start people getting the rocket emoji, like what's going on? And you and you scroll over to the... I've got my coin stats app like free down on my iPhone because I didn't want to look at it. But now I'm moving it back to the home screen. <laughs> I'm so oh, it's in the bar at the bottom. You're putting it in the bar at the bottom, right next to the You've got the, the stream messages. deck with the Bitcoin price in front of me, uh, live live stream. Well, what is it? Right it's, up, it's up almost a hundred year to date. All right, so mm-hmm. that's all I know. It's up almost a hundred percent year to date. Uh, Jack, what what's contributing to the pump right now? No investment advice. Well, my understanding. Jack sent a message. He said buying pressure. <laughs> yeah, buying pressure, <laughs> supply and demand. Supply well, and demand. we know my my uh, understanding of at least like the short term catalyst is this uh, BlackRock ETF that has been listed on some Nasdaq clearing platform. So that's not this being an approved instrument, but it's I think that's what's triggered the anticipation that this thing is about to get approved because back channels have been established. You know, signals are popping up on the platforms that would interact with such an instrument. There we go. There we go. Not investment advice, speculation. And you got uh, Larry Fink on CNBC every other day talking about Bitcoin as a flight to quality, mate. Do you know how how much personal Bitcoin Larry Fink puts out? Oh, my God. Insane. (laughs) Not sailor levels, but he's getting up there. What sailor? Sailor will be vindicated. He's 500 million in the green right now. But but, but he owns over 5 billion. Is it more? It might be more. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know the difference between MicroStrategy and Sailor and all that stuff, but the 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 number I've seen, yes, is 5 billion and 500 million of which is improv because he's been sort of uh, the running joke is Sailor always buys a local top, you know? So it's like you're, (laughs) it's like MicroStrategy has acquired 200 Bitcoin at this price and the next day. He's keeping the market. It's, tanks. it's that yeah. meme with the the boulder or whatever. He's just keeping. Yeah, he's it Sisyphus. There. Yeah, yeah, he is. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Eric, Wait, what so about I- you, mate? Eric, I know you've been into this world yourself as well. So uh, I don't know how much you've talked about it, but how are you feeling right now? I mean, I, I'm back to feeling smart about myself instead of bad about myself. <laughs> yeah, um, it's genius. time to start like kicking yourself for all the Bitcoin you didn't buy over the last year when it felt obvious, but you still didn't do it, right? Exactly. So you we should have done the ramp. We should have done the ramp tweet as meme of the week. Actually, you remember his tweet end one? of end of twenty twenty two is like crypto will never recover from this. Trust oh, is yeah. gone. Uh, <laughs> well, what about Jason Calacanis yesterday? No, that's another. That classic. was another one. Another. Classic. Well, he was saying interest seems to be low on uh, Bitcoin, but then a few people oh, yeah. were in the replies today. But uh, anyway, um, I haven't Eric, seen any laser eyes yet, so you can still keep buying. We got some time, man. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So absolutely no investment advice. But all jokes aside, I will say, <laughs> <laughs> all jokes aside, doing this podcast, like I love doing this podcast every week. is 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 amazing. It adds a lot to the week. But I will say, doing it in the bull market was very hard to beat. Oh, it was my, like it was I was euphoric. just getting that, those flashbacks, like last night with these memes coming through. And I shared one of, uh, I, f- I think I shared that meme in the Telegram group, but there's a few others that are a little bit less friendly for future oh, yeah. cancellation purposes, but it was just bringing back that energy, you know? And okay. it was, it's even the 2017 back Christmas for you guys. one. That's why. No, but, no, but here, exactly. but this I wasn't one, in the I headlines. Have yeah. I have a question for uh, Eric Jorgo, because before Bilal rattles off the list of questions he has, Eric, we're going to give you the platform here. 
I want you to pontificate on the pros and cons of Bitcoin. I, I, I want you to sound as intellectual. I want this to get clipped and to fly around Twitter. All right. So I we need a Michael Siller level explanation of why you hold Bitcoin. Sugar the platform powered is yours, sir. Tesla. Drogo, go. Uh, diversification, uh, quality, uh, decentralization, and FOMO. Those no, are my dude, reasons on, for holding no, Bitcoin. I didn't, I didn't hear. I did not hear the words encrypted or wall or energy. Because <laughs> I don't know what those point. words mean. Uh, I don't know what those words mean. <laughs> Neither do we, Eric. Don't worry. Right. <laughs> All right. Well, boys. I mean, is there anything else on on the the crypto pump before we get into Eric's project, what he's been working on? No, no man, it's going to be. Hopefully, we're going to be talking about it at the start of next week's episode. Exactly. We'll yeah, yeah. Since we're all retired next week. <laughs> Dude, I'm just, I'm gonna, one more on the Bitcoin is like, Trung, aren't you glad you made a bet about standing, not a bet about Bitcoin going to a million dollars for a million dollars? Oh, go. that's true. Uh, that's Could have been a. worse. Could have been worse. worse. You're that's right. True. That, that that's is a great true. point. Spineless is that. Well, I sent, I sent Jack Butcher a word yesterday. I, I called it. I said I talked about something. I said the word was craven. I said this individual's craven. I looked up the word. The craven means like no spine or uh, you know lack of confidence. It turns out that's me. I'm the craven <laughs> individual. <laughs> All right. So okay. Enough. Your subconscious Freudian. knew it. Yeah, yeah. My subconscious knew it. A very Freudian slip. But uh, we cleared the calendar for Eric. Blau, please start peppering him. I'm at this point. I'm sure. Oh, yeah, no, I mean, one, 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 one thing on. before we move on. Yeah, it, it. When did you sit down, Trunk? It was. Pr- yeah. It was like a couple. It was a week or two ago, right? <laughs> Maybe oh, yeah, that I'm was the time. Buys yeah. the top Hold exactly. Up. Buys <laughs> the top and then gives up. <laughs> sits down and it just takes off. Bro, when my son sees this year of podcast, <laughs> it, he's gonna be like, wow. Any respect I had for my old man is right out the window. All right. This guy, this guy sat down after 30 episodes. Well, here. Okay. I'm just going to explain why I'm sitting down. I'm start. I've been telling you guys, I'm starting this solo podcast and I just realized that I kind of keep moving my stuff around. My wife keeps moving shit around and like, I, I need this microphone to never move. Because moving around your microphone is annoying. And then when everything was standing, she kind of like come here and like, you know, you know, fiddling. We're all married here. Or like Blau basically is married at this point. The fiddling, the amount of fiddling that goes on. Like how much fiddling <laughs> happens on my shelf here. Just yeah, like this is definitely down, getting clipped in the future. Every time right? I come down, like a book is like, first of all, books are like always rearranged. Like they're never in the right order for her. Like they're, uh, the, some aesthetic about it is throwing her off. So I had to have no more fiddling. I told her, no more fiddling. I need a one by one space. You are not allowed to touch this. That's why I'm sitting. Is that, that what you mean? One by one by one. Is that where you're one, at right now? One meter by one meter square that <laughs> in this house that she is not allowed to touch. Everything else, I, I, I'm completely been kicked out of the house. I own one percent of this home and I'm no one's allowed to touch any of it. So anyways, that's go. the reason. There yeah. we go. Beautiful. All right, All right let's I'm gonna keep it moving here. Eric, again, welcome to the show, mate. Uh, good to have you here. I know you and Jack have uh, worked on the uh, Almanac of Naval back in the day as well. Yeah, man. Uh, us two did a pod together on Creator Lab some time ago as well. So we've had some overlap already. But why don't you tell oh, us yeah. a bit about how this book came to be? Because it's quite a unique story and it kind of ties in with what you're doing now as well. So why don't you just tell us the backstory? And I'm a super fan of Trung's Twitter also. Like we're all we're all three in it, just to be clear. Yeah, we this go. feels like this okay. feels like home to me. Um yeah, so this I mean, the Almanac and Naval was like this super happy accident that which I think we talked about on that creator lab episode. Like I just tweeted this like half-assed idea and went to bed and woke up and like five thousand people had replied and said like oh my god yes please do this and Naval had said I'm happy to support it. So that kicked off this like three year project that turned into the Almanac Naval which has wildly surpassed my biggest aspirations for it. Like absolutely has blown my mind. Um, and as a result of that, I mean, a ton of people kind of came out when that book came out and said like, Hey, you should do Andreessen. You should do Paul Graham. You should do Balaji. You should do like all these other people. And Balaji and I started kind of DMing about it. And he's like, man, this would be like, this would be awesome. Um, and I was like, hell yeah, it would be like, let's, let's get after it. Um, so, I mean, that's another three years of work, um, going through it again, it helped so much to kind of know what this final thing was going to look like and have the format down and have like, know that I could just holler at Jack and be like, Jack, help, <laughs> help. 
um it makes some beautiful really images anything. makes me sound like i contributed <laughs> way, way more than i did so that in was the first it... one in the first one the the uh the google doc this was such a cool thing to be like uh you know fly on the wall for essentially it was like this thing coming together in this sprawling document and then eric sort of mashing to get because there's so many disparate sources of podcasts and tweets and essays and like interviews with other people youtube videos and stuff just did an incredible job curating and making sense of it and building sections to you know yeah. marry up things that weren't together in the first place that i think actually speaks to how you know well formed the thoughts were in the beginning because they all kind of complement one another it's crazy to look over somebody so i did the math after the the noel book it was like L over a million words of like source material, like 10, 10 years of Naval talking and writing and sharing and getting interviewed and tweeting. And like, I don't know, somewhere between a million and 2 million words probably of like stuff that got distilled down and like plugging all the pieces together. And it is crazy to hear him like tweet about a thing in like 2014 and then talk about it in an interview in 2017 and see like how those ideas evolve and expand and get like both more concise and examples fold out of them and see them play out like as he's predicting it's crazy stuff um and then to try to put it all together but yeah i mean you you dm me when i was probably halfway through that project and we're just like hey i already made a bunch of these naval quote images like do you want to use them for the book and that was i mean that was early for you man what did you had like five thousand mm. followers at that point or something like that it was yeah, i mean it was crazy early his stuff is what kicked off, I think, uh, the network effect of visualized value on Twitter anyway. Like Taleb, yeah. Naval, was basically it. Those are the first two that I was like reading their stuff. The, you know, the the infamous thread, how to get rich without getting lucky. That was not like, infamous. That's not infamous. That's just a great thread. That's famous, period. <laughs> famous. There's no infamy involved. Okay, famous thread. That, uh, basically switched my worldview from this place yeah. that I've been operating in for years and years and years. And then, you know, 30 sentences was, was like rewired my brain. So, uh, yeah, dude, every yeah. interview I went on for the all and of all, I was like, read the book, but also if you want to see it being like lived in real time and like understand these principles, like go follow Jack and see everything that he's doing. Cause I don't know anybody who like read that thread, picked it up and applied it to their life in a more clear way like effectively executed way than you it was it was unreal well, like by the time that. the book came out you were already like orders of magnitude more like famous and successful like in that two years you just applied all that and cooked it was awesome what that year was, did that uh, thread come out 2013 or 2014 nah i don't know oh, no, no, no. i think it was like 20, i think it was later than that eight, 18 19 yeah, yeah 18 yeah. i think okay yeah, I, I remember reading that thread for the I actually remember exactly where I was when I read that thread. I applied zero of the principles on like Jack. <laughs> that's bo that's bollocks. <laughs> no, no, no. That's bollocks. I, I love when Jack throws out the English words. I know exactly bollocks, where I was mate. when I read that thread. I was at a uh, I was at a legal seafoods in Somerville, Massachusetts. <laughs> My wife wanted lobster. We're living in Somerville, so we went to Legal Seafoods. She got herself a lobster. I started reading the thread, and I, I I know exactly what I was thinking because it got to the part where he says, uh, look at some of the most famous billionaires in the world, Oprah, Donald Trump, Kanye West. Maybe maybe different in 2018 how you think of them now, but the whole point was the same, right? <laughs> and actually, no, the lesson actually goes both ways because he says, when you put your name on something, you get the ups and the downs. And the downs, yeah. yeah. Exactly, which is the lesson right there, right? With uh, uh, however you feel about those individuals. Uh, Oprah has obviously fared better in, in the public imagination than the other two. But the whole point is the same, though, right? They got all the wins on the way up. But then also, because you you earn the right to get those wins by being the person that takes the L, if that eventually yeah. does come. Whatever, I, I, that, That's what I remember, uh, Legal Seafoods. Uh, so perplexed. <laughs> Have you guys ever been to Legal Seafoods? Or is I that was just in Northeast. I was in uh, Boston Airport last week, and they they got one in. Oh there. yeah, oh they got the legal in, in mm -hmm. Logan in Logan Airport. That's the one, yeah. That's yeah. the most um, dubiously named restaurant I've ever. I know, heard. I, know. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> not, I, I hate that. <laughs> no way. Well, you think no about way the implication, I'm right? Because that means like in some time, the early one. 20th century, <laughs> there was like some illegal seafood shit going down. Probably oysters from the river that you shouldn't be eating, but uh. 
Eric, so you you mentioned something about I had two questions actually. Uh my first question was could do you know an example of a tweet that you heard in a in a later podcast where he had developed an idea that really blew your mind? I don't know if you do, but that's my first question. And then my second follow-up was I was wondering if you could talk more about the gathering of all these sources um uh, and then uh, turning into book. Because I do I remember when Scribe came out initially, we talked about more about the story about Scribe, but the yeah. idea that you know, uh, or society is more oral, right? Like historically, the or the language is the way we communicate information for like the large majority of uh, of human existence. And uh, basically, what you're doing is like writing is actually, if you think about the timescale of human history, is very atypical. So transfer information orally, which is what I mean, scribe helps people do, right? It's like basically, you talk to somebody or you send them hours of recording and they kind of bring it together, which is what you basically did when the Vols yeah. book. So could you, I don't know if you can answer the first one, if you saw an idea develop, but the second one was how did you wrangle, what was your thought process when you wrangled all these verbal ideas and I guess some text together? Yeah. So I, I'll, the best example actually probably is traced between, it's not obvious in the book, like what the timestamp of everything is, but you can go from the tweets, like in particular leverage is the one that sticks with me, like the tweets in uh, the book about leverage and then this expanded, like the chapter about leverage. And the book came out like 2020, which means I stopped collecting stuff like halfway through 2019. And then on the Naval podcast, he did an episode with Nivy where he's like talking through like the full, like really long mega episode of all of the principles. And he's got stories and examples about like the ladders of leverage going from like hourly, like dumb labor, basically to skilled labor, to manager to business owner to high tech business owner all the way up through and like explains it and like that's a really good like here's the here's the sentence version here's the pair here's the chapter version and here's the like three chapter version that you can see expanded over the course of like a few a few years probably three years um the philosophical stuff is almost like the reverse you know like you see those the word counts go down of like a philosophical concept down to something like if you can't be happy with a cup of coffee, you won't be happy with a yacht. And it's like, well, that's the one you remember. But it took him five years of like rephrasing and rephrasing and rephrasing to get to that like really, really tight thing. And he's like, to me, seeing that pattern gave me like permission to be like, what was the most popular thing I said two years ago? And how can I make it better? Like, how can I stick with an idea and keep either expanding it or distilling it? And there's so much, there's value to be gained in just pursuing that same idea in new ways that you kind of have to talk into sometimes because it kind of like feels cheap to do it. And it's like actually that like continuing to chip away at that is actually some of the best work you can do. I love that so much. That I mean, we've talked about it on this part, like Picasso's bull, right? Yeah. We got we, we got to bring up Picasso's bull. Rafa, throw up the picture of Picasso's <laughs> bull. <laughs> just the picture. Saying no. You're trying to find, well, this is what uh, Picasso says. He's trying to find the essence of the beast. That's what he said. And I mean, obviously Steve Jobs, uh, we talked about Steve Jobs and uh, the Picasso's bull, but the essence yeah. of the beast. So, okay, I love yeah, that. And what was so your the, other question? Wrangling. Oh, yeah, yeah. I was wondering if you could stick to the, uh, maybe focus more on the audio part because so much... I actually, I, you know who's mentioned this is Patrick O'Shaughnessy from Best Like the Best. He's talked mm -hmm. about this. The reason why they decided to do a podcast network is because he's like, there's all these so many smart people in the world uh, that just don't have time to write a book, right? And it's just yeah. actually so much easier just to spit. Like if you get hit with knowledge, right? If you get hit with good questions, which Patrick is obviously incredible at, yeah. you can share the amount of knowledge which would take you maybe forever, honestly forever, uh, in, in the in the context of someone's busy life to just sit yeah. down and work, right? Dude, I think there's something to that, just like the clutch factor of like, if somebody asks you a question in public and you just got to like answer it the best you can, it's actually so much more efficient than sitting down in a blank page and trying to figure out how to ask yourself the right questions and then answer them and then get convinced that it's the right answer. Like I go on podcasts all the time where somebody asks me an amazing question and I bullshit, I, I like conjure an answer to it. And I'm like, oh, that sounds pretty good. Like maybe that's a blog post in there. Maybe I can flesh that out. Maybe that's like not totally crazy. Um, so I think there's a lot. I mean, that's how almost all of what became the Nevalmanac got created, right? It was a ton of his clubhouses. It was a ton of his uh, podcast interviews, stuff like that. That and his Twitter were most of the raw material. And I actually think that's part of the part of the secret sauce of why it feels so intimate to read. Like when people read it and they're like, 
man, I, fl- I didn't put it down. Like I read that in one day. And, and that's that's because the thread of ideas is clear, but it's also because you feel like it's a conversation. It's not dry. It's not clinical writing. It's not overly, I don't know, specific. It doesn't, I, I pulled out all the like random explanations of stuff that didn't need to be explained. Like I wanted to feel like a conversation, like you're asking the questions and getting the answers person to person over a dinner table in real time. And that's partly because it came from conversation. Like the book reads like that. And I think that's so much, that's so much more accessible. It's so much more memorable. It's so much more fun to, to read something like that than, I don't know, something that was like written in a more professional way. That's just like less personal. Well, it's like that yeah. advice that writers always, I mean, some of the best writers in the world are just going to just write like, uh, uh, write yeah. like you talk. Right. So it's yeah. like quite literally you did that. It's like, write Like you talk It's because there, yeah, there wasn't a chance for it to not happen. Right. Like it, it, yeah. we started with, you know, transcriptions of, of, uh, a bunch of his conversations, a bunch of his interviews. And there's a bunch of reasons that's shitty, right? Like transcriptions are a pain in the ass to edit. There's a ton of, the, not with Naval cause he's like wildly talented speaker, but there's a ton of filler words, digressions, things like that. So it's a, it's work to edit, but you do get that tone. If you, if you work hard to preserve it, like you get that tone. And I think we got the same thing with, with biology too. There's a bunch of stuff that's not grammatically correct, but it feels good to read and it feels like a smooth cadence and it feels like having a conversation. Like that's what I want those books to feel like. Yeah. Eric, just a quick question on the difference between, as we talk about biology's book now, uh, I mean, the new book about Mm. biology's uh, writing and words. How is that different to writing the Naval one? Because like you said there, Naval is kind of famous for distilling these complex ideas into like incredible one-liners and these metaphors that you just remember like you said a few uh, like kind of like tweets but in verbal form yeah. a lot of the time whereas biology has some of those zingers when you're listening to a seven hour podcast but he also has the complexity this kind of like giga brain phd level yeah, style man. of talking sometimes which is a lot harder to distill in some ways so i'm curious like how was that different doing it this time around yeah it was it was a much tougher filter for biology like biology spends a lot of time um like teaching master classes i'll say right like naval works really hard to distill and simplify and get to the essence of stuff and biology works really hard to be incredibly thorough and incredibly clear but it's in doing that he often will like He's like, well, let me explain this thing in order to explain this other thing. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, whoa, 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 you lost me halfway through the first thing, bro. Like, you gotta. Mm, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And so a lot of people were like, had uh, the phrase I keep hearing is like, have trouble bringing him down to earth or like have trouble mm. like pulling out the lessons to actually apply it. But he's so, he's so smart, man. But like Balaji, all of his, his long conversations really gear around super evidence-based. Like you see his tweets, his long tweets, and they're like, cited with graphs and footnotes and stuff yeah i love the footnotes it's like you're reading an academic paper but like way shorter yeah yeah i I mean i love that from from a sense of like for how important truth is to him and he's like really trying to have a conversation to get to like the reality of what's happening and like really wants to engage on that level which i deeply respect but it's it's hard for like not everybody can do it and he's trying to cut through that like bullshit pontification layer um, but it, it does sometimes like leave people behind. And so what I tried to do is kind of like in, in the book, filter out all the, con- all the like, uh, contemporary stuff, all the like, Hey, here's my take on the breaking news. Here's why Bitcoin is like great this year. Here's my take on political situation X. And this book is like the evergreen foundation, like the, the key ideas that are most universally applicable to the most people. It's, it's really like the why his, the why of his worldview, like, the most foundational piece of like technology is this incredible moral good. And it's the foundation of all the, the good things that keep us from having to like starve and fight and kill each other. Um, truth and how to determine it and you know why it's important to assess different versions of truth. And then his basically like toolkit for building companies is the whole third section. It's basically like zero to one. It's like, here's tactically like how I go about building companies, building organizations, building movements and, if you found an idea and an opportunity you want to pursue like this is my best advice for going after it nice nice 
And and so um, what, you kind of talked about scribe there. We didn't really go into the detail of that, but like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what does scribe do? Because a lot of people haven't heard of it or don't know what you guys do there. So how is that different to just what a regular author does, lock themselves in a room for two years and try not yeah. to hurt themselves? So what 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 is the process like with you guys? Yeah, so scribe is is the the first the creator of this category of professional publishing. They are they are the first, the biggest, and the best professional publisher. And to me, this is where all publishing is going to be going over the next like 10, 20 years. This is where the big, like new age, next generation publishing companies are going to get built. And there's a few kind of important reasons for that. But basically, if you go traditional publishing, you're going to give up almost all of your creative rights creative decision-making power and almost all of your financial outcome. It's basically like starting a company and selling 80% of that company, like before you even get started for your advance. Like if you get a hundred thousand dollar advance, they take 85% of your royalties and majority control of this thing that you're about to create. And like, you better hope you get a lot of value out of it. Um, I, like, Can you explain how, how that, that advance, advance works? Yeah. I mean, you go, like, if you say you're going to write a book and you want to go traditional publishing, like you go get a book agent, the book agent will sign an agreement with you where they take 15% of whatever outcome you get. And then they go shop you to these traditional publishers. And so they'll take you to like, you write a proposal and they'll take you to the big houses. It's kind of like raising venture capital, honestly, um, except way more like, except they take majority control. So if you go to one of those publishers, it's like, they'll give you money up front. So you got time and financing to kind of like go write your book, but it's an advance on your royalties. So let's say they give you a hundred grand um, that values your book at say, I don't know if that's 15% or 10% after your agents cut, like say that values your book at a million dollars. Now, if you go sell a million copies, like you gave up the vast majority of the upside. Also, they get to decide who your audiobook narrator is, the final title, the final cover design. Like they get creative control over this thing um, that you may not want to give them. And you lose the opportunity to do stuff like, like I knew and Naval and I talked about it early on. Like we wanted to make this digital version available for free, like to anybody all over the world. You can't do that with a traditional publisher. Um, if you want to use your book to go speak at conferences and go give it away to, you know, thousands of people because it's lead gen for your business. Can't do that with a traditional publisher because they care about the royalties. Right. So there's, or if it's just, you want to write a book, but it's for a smaller like niche market. Um, like a big traditional publisher is not going to touch that. It's not worth them investing in. It's not worth them putting the time into. So that's why this category kind of got started. Um, and Tucker Max founded Scribe Publishing like 10 years ago. Uh, it was called Book in a Box then. So it turned into, turned into Scribe Media. And it was basically a solution for all these people who wanted to control their, wanted creative control of their book and wanted the full financial upside or wanted the flexibility of just being able to do whatever they wanted with their book. Um, so there's basically three paths. If you already wrote a book, you got your manuscript done and you want to get it published at a super high quality, world-class professional level, like you bring it to Scribe and we will do the proofreading, the copy editing, the page layout, the cover design, we'll help it get distributed, we'll get it everywhere it needs to be. You will have a book that is like of indistinguishable quality from a top quality, a uh, top tier professional, a traditional publisher. Like that's what David Goggins did, right? So when he wrote his memoir, he's was that like, with Scribe or was that? Yeah, that was. Oh, with I didn't realize he did that. Oh, oh okay, wow. shit! Oh, Dude, that he must added, be. Oh, that's crazy. I'll just say because he added. Uh, uh, maybe if you can address this to your point about how uh, different it is the creative process. He adds yeah. a, a Q and A uh, part at the end of every chapter, right? In the audio book yeah. too. Yeah, in yeah. the audio book. Maybe traditional, you'd have to jump through a lot of hoops for that to happen. Yeah. You, you, a, you may not get a chance to do that. Um, but like, that's also, so I'm sure he sold a bunch of like both formats in part because he did that. Right. So he's, that's can't hurt me. is one of the best selling memoirs of all time, millions and millions of copies. And so there's authors that are like outselling him, but back to the point about like owning your full financial upside, like he's earning a hundred percent of his royalties on every book because scribe does not legend. Scribe How much has he made off that book? Has he made 50 mil? Like just, I don't know if you know. I'm just saying like ballpark. What would you get? Uh, that, that's not, that'd be on the high side of possible, but not crazy. 
like so when this guy ten, is ten, bucks, ten, fees, ten bucks a book is ten bucks a book is probably high, but like I don't know what his yeah like. what his other what his other stuff is. He's also like, this guy's worth eight to nine figure. I just call it eight. And he's still waking up every morning with his shirt off, yelling at you, doing a three-hour run. Because <laughs> he about loves that, you. Because he loves you. Stay hard. Um, <laughs> Stay hard. <laughs> <that's>, <laughs> no, First thing you hear in the morning, Trunk. Wait, yeah. Jorgie, I'm going to have to hate you. I'm going to have – okay, so oh, sorry. Uh, uh, the, the three ways. If you had a book, uh, manuscript okay, ready, yeah. uh, you can go to you uh, uh, and the other two. Yeah. Oh, the other two are like, say, say Trung, you wanted to like, you wanted to write a book, but you hadn't started. And you're like, I don't want to fuck around. I don't want to waste time. I don't want to get it wrong. Like coach me through this process. Like we will, you show up on day one and we will like Gandalf you all the way through writing a book. And in 15 months, you will have a fully edited, Gandalf the professionally gray or Gandalf published. Gandalf the white. Gandalf the white. <laughs> Yo, <laughs> that should be the title even, of I'm your insulted. first chapter. I'm in, yeah. <laughs> All right, so you guys will walk. Incredible. You guys will literally. Uh, but uh, okay, you you'll walk us yeah, through. We'll help you. Yeah. Present, we'll help you write. We'll help you make a plan. We'll like edit constant feedback with like one-on-one okay. -on -one personal coaching as you go through. Then all the publishing stuff comes after. And then the final version is for people who like, I don't care if I write it, I just want the book. And that's where, where you're talking about with the speaking. So then that, someone will interview you, pull that knowledge out of you, do all the hard work to create the outline and the structure and just like do all of the writing work and still still 100% your book, all your royalties, all your ideas, you get final edit. Um, but like you basically hire a scribe to help walk you through that whole process. So you can have a book in basically like 50 hours of total time. So that's for people with like, oh, wow. take as little time as possible from me and get me a book like with my name on it and full of my ideas at the end of a year. We can do that in 50 hours. Um, just being really, that's like the maximum high leverage way to do it. And we do audio book and we do like book promotion. We do all kinds of other like add-on stuff, but like that's the fundamental like three paths is just choosing which one of those you want. Eric, how do you guys charge for that last one? Is that like a just a one-off fee or is it like a percentage of sales or something later? No, all of our stuff is is like fixed fee, like upfront. We're a professional services firm. And so that's like you get all of the financial upside of your book. So if you want, you want to take the risk, like you pay us and we will execute this and you will have a book and you own all the rights, all the files, all the everything. If you want to just give it all away at the end, 100%, you can do that. Um, if you are got Goggins and you go make, you know, tens of millions of dollars on this book, like it's all yours to keep. We have no claim on it whatsoever. Just so I know roughly like what's the minimum amount you spend on something like this, if someone to do it. Oh, um, the scribe professional, which is the, like, we write it for you is yeah. like 48 K we coach oh, you through is like 36 K publishing depends. It's kind of between like 18 and 24, depending on what you want. That's great. Awesome, yeah. man. Very cool. Um, Jorgo, I got a question. First of all, thank you for describing that. Uh, I got to hit you with the steel man. Can you steel man the case for traditional publishing? Yes, hundred like, percent. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I have like no problem saying traditional publishing is is like uh, key for some people and is the right path for some people. So, um, if you need a, an advance in order to get your book off the ground, like if you need it financially to get the time to write, hundred percent. Like we cannot offer that for you, and you should go with a traditional publisher. Um, if you are really, if you are Oprah or Prince Harry or somebody who like, you know, you're going to sell the books um, and you have negotiating leverage over them and you can get a really fat advance, 100% do it. Um, they do have like incredible distribution and networks. So if you really, really want your book to be everywhere in the world on day, like I was in an airport in South Africa and Shane Parrish's book, Clear Thinking came out and it was like front and center on all the shelves in South Africa, like on the, its launch day. And I was like, damn, okay. Like that's a good case for traditional publishing. And I don't know what imprint he went with, but um, I know it was a traditionally published book. And then the other is um, if it is just really important to you for some reason to be on the New York Times bestseller list, like that's a very like political thing. Like that is not a meritocratic list to be on. That is a like, you got to be in the cool kids, like, New like York it's traditional not publisher based, club right? is not numbers based. Yeah, I actually Jordan Peterson never made that, that list. And yeah. oh, man. everyone's got 12 rules to Dude, life. <laughs> James, James, James Patterson. There you go. James Patterson sued New York Times for like libel over that list because he had a book that outsold a ton of things, but it was about cops during Blue Lives Matter and they wouldn't they wouldn't ah. put his book on the list. And he sued him. Um Goggins got on it. He's one of the only self-published people to get on it, but it took 
high, a huge number of time and a way higher bar of sales. So it's possible, but it's, um, yeah, it's just like one of those things. You also, know? one you thing know what about- happened? Hold on, so on, I, on, I think I know what happened with uh, Goggins and the New York Times list. I think some editor just had saw like his 50th straight Instagram and <laughs> just like, guys, yeah, this guy is, we, we, gotta, gotta we, on. we gotta keep this guy off the list. This guy just did a nine hour run. His feet are bleeding. His kidney is falling out. <laughs> this guy's on the list. We gotta get, he's gonna kill us. We gotta get this guy on the list. By the way, Sorry, Eric, I don't know if you know the details of this, but when I'd worked on this a few years ago for a, a book that ended up getting on New York Times bestseller list. And I no completely way. lost all respect for the New York Times bestseller list because essentially <laughs> when you see what happens, most people who, not most, but a lot of people hire this one particular agency who know how it works inside out. And I, I don't want to use the word game because it's not necessarily like you're doing something illegal. It's just, they know the rules of how it works. And like a few things I remember were like, for example, Amazon sales and uh, in-store sales aren't counted as the same. Like they're, they're ranked, uh, this might have changed as well, but at this time, this is maybe like five or seven years ago. And um, so like if you buy it from the store, it's worth like, let's just say two, sales versus one on Amazon or something like that. Kindle is is different to audiobooks to hard hardback and all that stuff. And so what happens is people end up just going like selling this in mass with like if you've got a company for example, you can go and say to all your partners and all your customers and say, "Hey, buy this for your employees, yeah. buy this for whoever as gifts for Christmas." And then you start stacking up sales of this book and that goes towards this big number. So it's kind of a crazy thing because everyone has like a normal person wouldn't know that that's how it works and uh, it's a bit of a, a bit of a sham in my opinion but um so i had a question on the biology stuff so as we kind of transition to some of the ideas that resonated from the book you've obviously got your hoodie on today biology was right designed by jack butcher jack butcher original jack butcher original but we, we talked about the naval thread earlier the how to get rich without getting lucky his most famous kind of um, idea there. What is the equivalent of that for biology, do you think? Or are there maybe a few that we can go into a little bit? Yeah, there's probably a few. I think uh, similar to Naval, I think he was very early to crypto and a lot of people, he, he kind of brought a lot of people either from tech into crypto or became an early kind of leader in that crypto world. Um, I know he invested early in a ton of those things. I know he's like a friend with Vitalik. Um owns a ton of coins um there is also i mean he was post early economic i think he post economic it. yes yeah. uh yeah i mean he's had he's a, like a, had a bunch of careers I mean, he was like a startup founder he, he a phd in uh computational biology from stanford and then his first company was in this clinical genomics company that they sold for 400 million dollars and uh, started this early crypto company. It became earn.com that sold to Coinbase. And that's when he went and uh, was CTO at Coinbase for a while in kind of their like hyperscale days. Um, so he's had a bunch of different things. And he was that uh, investor as well, right? Andreessen. Yeah, he was a bit. GP at Andreessen Horowitz. Um, and so he did a bunch of interesting kind of companies there. I don't know what exactly like he did personally as an angel versus what he led at A16Z. Um, but he he did a lot of like interesting writing and stuff around that time too, especially around like, and there's some of this in the book, the the balance between kind of like regulated industries and non like where regulation holds stuff back, right? Because like Uber and Airbnb were technically like illegal for a long time, and in some places still are. And to think like that those companies couldn't exist and that value wouldn't be created because of these outdated laws that didn't sort of anticipate, couldn't anticipate what technology was capable of, um, just looking around for those opportunities. And as an entrepreneur, maybe not being afraid to kind of charge at some of those laws. Um, but also as you think about, you know, voting or who you, as, how you govern or whatever, just being like, uh, maybe like less laws could be good in some places, like a little less regulation. Um, and I think we're seeing that happen in, in like nuclear now, like I invest in a couple of nuclear startups. We're starting to see sentiment change around that. And as a result, eventually legislation change around that. And that's all super, super cool. Um, but I think, and then of course, COVID is like, he was one of the very early people to kind of like look at the data coming out and be like, oh, guys, yeah. guys, 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 we got a problem. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so that was a big, that was a big one. And then, I mean, most recently is probably just writing the network state and starting to kind of carry that flag about 
and, and this is another example to Trung's question of like watching ideas evolve. I think his first time talking about this concept publicly was back in like 2013. I think it was that year, but he gave a talk um, about like Silicon Valley's exit at Y Combinator. And that's what the seed of those ideas is what became the network state, which is a book maybe a year or two ago. And then, and now he's like out there starting the network state, like the network state conference is in a week in Amsterdam and he's like going around and collecting these people and sort of building this coalition of people to effectively start a new country. Like it's this crazy ambitious thing. And all of it is to embody and to like empower these sort of ideas that are in this book that at his core is about like technological sort of optimism and the fact that we need to we need paths for technology to evolve without being stifled by regulation and space frontiers for humans to take risks and keep pushing there's like what made so much of how we live today great is these like areas where people were just like fuck it like let's do it if you see like there's so many memes about like how safe shit was in 1920s in america like not at all safe there's people just like standing on airplane wings and climbing flagpoles and playgrounds were just death traps and there were no airbags and people were just like riding around with hanging out of cars and it was just like i'm just gonna take this drug and see what happens like maybe i'll be cured maybe i'll be dead but nobody's gonna stop me let's go and like it's we are so risk averse now as a society it's crazy yeah um and that's, I mean, the thing he points out, like you're allowed to bungee jump and skydive, but you're not allowed to take like this potentially life-saving drug if you have a terminal illness because the FDA won't let you. Like what kind of freedom is that? That's fucked. Um, so I, it, like things like that is kind of like, wait, now that I think about it, that is fucked up, um, both from a societal perspective and an individual freedom perspective. So like maybe let's work on that or maybe let's go somewhere where we have the freedom to do those kind of things. So I, I, I respect the boldness of the vision to be like, fuck it, I'm going to go start my own country. Um, yeah, it's pretty wild. awesome. That is one. Jack, I mean, I was going to ask you as well, because you shared all these cool visuals that you put in the book. Um, I, I don't think you shared all of them, but like there's a, a few sample in there. How did that process go, by the way, for you two? Did you, Jack, did you just like, did you read through parts and were like, oh, this would be cool for visual or was it uh, Eric suggested? Or I'm curious how that worked. I'm pretty sure we just had, I just had the manuscript and just picked out the most like ill, like the things that lend themselves to illustrations was basically how it mm. worked. Same thing with the, um, the Naval book as well. It's just can print out the print. Like that's the process, print out the whole manuscript and just sort of like flick through and it stuff just catches you. It's like these, uh, I guess the way these, these two guys specifically think there's so much logic in the way they assemble their ideas that they kind of the 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 illustrations just like build themselves basically you just see the thing and it's like oh yeah it's already um it's already halfway there in in my mind just based on how well the the idea has been explained if you're a genius maybe that's how it works I don't know, man. <laughs> Dude, Jack, Jack blows my mind every time with it. Like, that's not how my brain works. And so to me, it's just like, it is like a magic trick every time I like see these things. It's it's so cool. Yeah, I remember Jack, when you did uh, visualize value office hours, do you remember that back in the COVID days? Mm -hmm. And you would be on your iPad just illustrating stuff live, like someone would be telling you a story and you'd be like, oh yeah, it's like this. And I'm like, that shit is still wild to me. Um, did you guys want to share any? Jack, do you want to share some of those visuals, or I can share my screen as well if you We've, prefer. Yeah, I'll scroll through them quick. Uh, yeah, yeah. A lot of them are. Uh, that and, thread was blowing up. Actually, let's. Uh, what? Uh, yeah. Why don't you guys talk through some of these ideas? Yeah, that's what I was saying. And Eric, you can definitely expand on some of them too, mate. So, um, yeah, I didn't do this in any particular order. These are just some of the ones that I guess my my favorites or the ones that resonate with me as I was working through them. Uh, I don't, the, I'm trying to think about the differences between the Naval and, 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 and this one is they are almost more specific to Eric's point. They're like very, um, I don't know that Naval tends towards like the more philosophical, like broadly applicable, uh, applicable ideas that you kind of, go away and think about for a long time and then this you know this thing starts to apply to it that thing starts to apply to it and these are way more of a like 
smash you in the face. Oh yeah, you like you just proved me wrong, or you just completely <laughs> like changed my mind or something instantly. Both are obviously incredibly useful and complement each other really well. Like this first one is in hindsight, everyone believes they take a risk and get in early, but another risky early opportunity is in front of you today. It's just like that to have that mentality installed is so um very fitting for today, by the way. Yeah, um, very fitting for today. And, advice, but yeah. and just applying that to his career too. Like you, clearly that's been a belief that is deep rooted in everything that he's done for decades and decades. Um, that actually, Jack, that connects really well to another one that's later, which is the consensus, non-consensus beliefs. I think it's like yeah. the fourth or fifth one, maybe. Jack, do you actually want to walk it. through uh, for the listeners when you do pull one up, uh, what the there you hell go, yeah. going on? This contrarian one. contrarian is temporary. You are contrarian until you convince everybody you are correct. Then your ideas become conventional wisdom. Then you repeat. Yeah, I love this one. It's like that it's so it's so obvious after you've consumed it, but you're uh like the, I had this I can't remember where this came from. But it's like the perpetual contrarian is never right, right? Contrarian to be like rewarded with the title of contrarian and be correct you have to like move on to the next contrarian thing once you are, you know, once the cyber hornet prophecy comes, right, comes yeah. true, boys. <laughs> cyber hornet. <laughs> when you're like going nuts on a podcast, like with 200 listeners, and then you're on CNBC five years later talking to Larry Fink. Hey, about hey your... I hope you're not talking about Michael Saylor on NIA there, no, Jack. No, no, no. <laughs> oh, I, I, I see. What uh, we got concerned. way more than 200 on that pod. <laughs> that's true. That's true. That's an important idea. Contrarianism is a temporary state of affairs because people change their minds. Well, that actually reminds me of what Jeff Bezos says that him and Peter Thiel had a mini, uh, mini both, uh, when, uh, Thiel was uh, pumping for Trump. Uh, I think Bezos said something to the effect of, uh, the problem with contrarians are they're often wrong, but that's the point, right? Is like you can't hit everything, but uh, if you do, oh my goodness, your bags are heavy. <laughs> yeah, we got some others in there. What else we got? Uh, this one's a great one. I think the after you solve the biggest problem, something else becomes the biggest problem. Another great just that. reframe of how you have to think in order to make things better consistently. Uh, this one is great too. Obviously the, like this narrative that he's engineered over the last few years of BTC, NYT, CCP. He's such a great, like, uh, it's like poetic. Yeah. He's got the, he's got this very profound ability to go up and down and, and, uh, summarize something as a sentence. And that was actually how the network state book was presented is, Here's this book in a sentence. Here it is in a paragraph. Here it is in a thousand word essay. Here it is in a book. Yeah. Like, I think like this information architecture and even the like biological knowledge to me lends itself to that too. Like the highly technical people that are also incredibly articulate are so rare that when like you have those, I actually had the, I, I spoken to him once on the phone. And the thing that was the most remarkable about that interaction was he was talking about one thing and writing something else. I like had a screen share going on a Google doc. He was like writing one thing and he was saying something else. And I was like, how are you doing that? And just next level, uh, like, yeah, the neurons are yeah. firing at a, at a speed that I have not experienced before. Well, actually, Jack, could we just read Dude. that one out? Cause I did really like that. The, uh, I don't think we read the full that on this politics. One? Yeah. And for yeah. people only listening, we can just describe the visual as well. Yeah. So, uh, the visual is basically two, you could think of it as two pie charts. One is just divided up into these random, uh, amounts. And the second is divided, split down the middle and separated. So it's two separate, um, halves of a circle. And the caption is equity unites and politics divides. So that's great. These, yeah, these ideas of, having a common mission and, you know, trying to build something that serves a purpose versus, you know, ad hominem attacking ad finitum for, uh, for, you know, just, I think that's the, uh, there's something, there's something ironic about all this stuff too, because there's something political about 
the views espoused in these in these books, but at the same time, you could kind of defer back to the factual arguments of technology improves life by this metric, that metric, this metric. So, um, yeah, just a really powerful, succinct way to distill probably, you know, if you listen to a Tim Ferriss podcast with this guy you could talk about this unpack this one visual for, for three hours. five hours <laughs> yeah. yeah and not not he could he probably already did he probably <laughs> has yeah, yeah 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 and and sometimes like i mean what eric's done is so incredible and useful and valuable for so many people because the eight hour conversation is really you know the slither of people that are going to listen to that um you know they're almost already bought into some of these ideas but if you can make them more accessible on the front end, then maybe somebody reads the book, then goes and listens to that thing and has more of an appreciation for how all this stuff fits together. It's like trying to, be, this is some of the thesis behind Visualized Value originally too, is like more people should be reading Naval's ideas. Let's make a, uh, an image that sort of distills one of the profound insights into something that like uh, makes you stop your thumb and read it. And then you're like, oh, who's this guy? And yeah. I would... I would definitely bet that more people were introduced to the longer form content through the like summarized, distilled, you know, visualized versions of some of these. Oh yeah, concepts. definitely. I love definitely. how you said that. If you're listening to the full eight hour Lex Balaji podcast, you're probably already agreeing. <laughs> right. Like, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, let's, yeah. let's cue Keep this up. It, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're not just like going through Spotify and going, oh, that looks it. Yeah. Who's this guy? Let's listen to that. that Seven hours, hours, seven hours, 57 minutes. Yeah. 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 (laughs) Could you imagine the one person that there for sure, there was one person that was scrolling through and saw eight hours. Like, Hey, you know what, man? Like I got a road trip. Never heard this Lex guy. Uh, Somebody, I want to talk to the person that threw up for eight hours and just what happened to them afterwards. Convert anybody with that kind of stamina. I want to see what they got to say. Yeah. 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 (laughs) Yeah, it's remarkable, man. Oh, I love this. Let's do, let's do this one. This is a good one, yeah. Usain Bolt can run two times faster than most people. One algorithm can run a thousand times faster than another. Oh, that's Scales sick. differ in software. So That's a little bit of slander on Usain Bolt, though, man. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to say, yo, put some respect on that man's name. Put some respect on that that's man's actually, name. Yeah, that would be community noted, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> No, but, but that, yeah, obviously point. people can't see the visual, but the scale obviously makes it obvious. That's really nicely done, man. Yeah, Beautiful. a lot of what we talk about here as well is just like the imperceptible network effects and your power laws of technology. And to understand that is is uh, very crucial if you're... Let me let me uh, let me bring this down to the works. metal for some people in this one. This is, uh, this is this idea that you've drawn here and that uh, Eric wrote about. This was the basically the core of Netflix's uh, famous uh, culture deck that they released in 2009. The, uh, the Netflix, people don't remember, in 2009, they paid two to three times what the market rate was for an engineer, or they would 2x an mm. engineer's uh, or designer's salary. Well, they 2x it, but with a lot less equity upside, but guaranteed cash. And this is not like, obviously, in hindsight, you'd want to take all the fang equity you could, but in 2009, that might not necessarily have been the case, right? Well, Facebook wasn't even public. Contrarianism. Then. Yeah, contrarian. And uh, <laughs> but they had a they had a they had a slide in there. It was exactly almost identical to that image. The slide idea is like in 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 manufacturing, like the best the best guy with a screw, the guy that can put a screw into the car. He's two times to- well, Jack, he used to do the, the best screw guy. Too, yeah. It's probably two times better than the than the than the second best screw guy. But then in software, obviously you can be a ten or hundred times better, which is why they're willing to pay. Uh, way above market yeah. but uh i love that that's, idea. A, that's an old steve jobs idea too i remember him talking about that hit it though uh, about the software being like if you could be uh significantly yeah, i think more for valuable. him it was 10x better but yeah it's like the best hardware engineers are 10x more valuable than like the dynamic range of what what the best have versus what you know you can be a 2x better bus driver than the next guy you can be a 10x better yeah. hardware engineer the, like the mm, returns yeah. on some of those skills someone you uh, might have heard of trunk satoshi nakamoto <laughs> um oh my goodness is there any more of those uh, i know we just went through those but eric i saw that yeah so the book is split up into three parts one is technology two is truth and the third is building the future uh, i'll call out a few of the things that i 
I haven't obviously had a chance to read the whole thing yet since it was only a few days ago and it came out today. Uh, I got it a few days ago. But uh, uh, the one thing that might be worth talking about is the different types of truth. I thought that was mm. quite cool. There's scientific truth, technical, political, economic, cryptographic. And then there's a whole part on protecting the truth, which is maybe the brings it all together. But maybe just sharing those that idea of how that progresses. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting one. Um, we, we tend to think of truth as being like just one thing. There is one truth um, and not subdividing them. So scientific or technical truth is kind of like the what would an, would an alien come to the same conclusion? Like how many atoms are in that molecule? Like what is the temperature of that thing? Like these are not subjective. Um, political truth is something that is basically just exists in our collective agreement. So the order of a country is not a thing that an alien would know or would arrive at the same conclusion. But if we all believe it to be true, we have created that truth. Um, economic truth, I like because it's where sort of stated intentions and like internal reality differ. So like express preferences, right? Of like, oh, no, nobody wants health, uh, unhealthy food. Like we shouldn't have it. But like, fucking everybody eats at McDonald's all the time. So like, don't tell me there isn't demand for that. And don't tell me there isn't like a real thing, an outcome there. Um, the other piece that's I think really interesting in economic truth is this comparison between the uh, USSR, like the communist Soviet Union and the US and it being like that in biology's in biology's eyes and he's read a bunch about this and there's some books about it in the recommended reading like the reason that the soviet union fell apart is because it required people to lie to each other like you were fabricating production numbers you were telling people like that you had to keep working that they were going to get this thing and that like over iterations of that game the system falls apart nothing operates correctly and the capitalist system rewards this like harsh reality like what is the truth um and so over you know decades of competing with each other like our system the capitalist system just like was better than the communist system because it interacted more with the fundamental like truths of reality of how things get done how much of something we have how much everybody has how much value they're contributing and i think that's like a really important thing to remember since we apparently now have like open socialists in, sitting in congress um which is a crazy thing and then cryptographic is like uh, obviously biology early on crypto, early on Bitcoin and talking about how there's no incentive or th there's no incentive. There uh, is, sorry, the incentives for capturing and preserving the truth now outweigh the incentives for hiding it. So if you think about like some of the political events that would have happened in history, it'd be much harder to hide the truth if it had to be like hashed into the chain and we were like, yeah, but did that happen or did it not like show me the image hashed in like the day or the hour or the minute that this thing happened. Um, and so getting to this point, it's a thought experiment, but getting to the point where if we have all these digital records of all these things happening, we can replay like the full, like almost the video game the Sims version of a society and see what actually happened in real time and start to like track back on what was honest, what wasn't. Um, so I, I think it's a really like, that's an interesting journey through different types of truth, um, the importance of it. And then just thinking about, you know, as an entrepreneur, as a founder, like how do you arbitrage like what people want to believe versus what the fundamental reality is? You know, if you can see the truth and you can create a product based on a truth that other people either can't see or can't admit to themselves, like that is a... That is a, a very rich vein of ideas. Yeah, I love that. I love the multiple types of truth. That 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 that's uh, that's fresh. Jack, you're on mute. Go on. You about to say something? I was going to say this is like a this is a, a tangential thought, but you know those memes where it's like the market will regulate itself, and then it's like uh, <laughs> the white guys laughing. It, yeah. No, it, that, <laughs> no, it's like the the eight stacked tall KFC, you know, uh, like Dr Pepper deep fried, whatever it is. Ranch, but there is a desire for that soda. Yeah, yeah there's, exactly. There, there's a market for that. <laughs> That's great. I love that. The KFC um, double double down chicken sandwich. Exactly. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that sounds pretty conservative to me. But uh, Eric, could you uh, kind of going back to what we touched about earlier, wrangling these ideas. Can you actually walk through a bit of more of uh because Jack highlighted he saw a bit of that Google Doc when you were doing it real time with uh 
with Naval. Like, uh, what what is it like to wrangle these ideas? Like, because they're, they're so different to be a kind of an editor and curator versus inventing from scratch. But it sounds yeah. like a lot of that also did happen because of you had to connect these pieces. So how did you wrangle all this information that wasn't meant for a book? Yeah, I mean, it feels like the best analogy is like doing a jigsaw puzzle. Like imagine people just like dumped like 10 different jigsaw puzzles worth of pieces on you and you had to like make something beautiful out of it. And you're like, all right, well, I got to like, I got to organize and then I got to like see what pieces fit together and then I got to figure out what to throw away. And like, it's just this huge process of like sorting important ideas or foundational ideas or things that I actually want, believe can benefit the reader um things that i want the world to be more like and i'm a big uh a big believer like i wonder if actually to what extent you guys would agree with this like you're all creative you're all creators like the scale of curation to creation is like much smaller than people think oh yeah especially it's especially on the internet right like uh, yeah everything is no that's such a great point there are very few uh, zero to one level creators, right? Like, uh, like yep. the people that are able to create. And then the, here's the reality. There's been a hundred billion people on this earth. Like the idea that you're going to create something whole cloth that hasn't been done before is actually honestly kind of impossible at this point. Unless you're Einstein. Nobody does it. Yeah. yeah. Like literally, right? Yeah. Um, I, I love that. I love how you said that. Is uh, That's a, a very important unlock because I know for a lot of people, sorry to mean to cut you off, but like I know oh. for a lot of people, uh, creative blocker is the idea that they think they have to create something completely brand new right yeah the the trap of like chasing originality is such a is such a gnarly thing like be inspired do, do work that is like directly adjacent and we you know we all four could go start a new book on biology and like even if we had the same process and followed literally the same steps that i did we'd all end up curating very different things focusing on different ideas editing them in different ways ordering things in different like in in different ways I, like to me, like somebody tweeted earlier today, like this is a hot take, but the Naval Manac was like more an Eric book than a Naval book. And I think like not in an egocentric way at all, like that that's actually true. And that if 10 other people wrote a Naval book, they would all be interesting and useful and valuable and different. Um, especially with somebody like Bology or Naval, where there's so much there, there's so many interesting things. And I learn, I mean, part of what I love about this process is like, I just spend so much time with these component ideas, like marinating in them, trying to figure out how they fit together, tracing them over time, figuring out how they support each other or contradict each other. Like, and that's where you start to actually change your worldview and start to now I'm like, Oh, now I like know how biology thinks about these different things. Now I'm going to invest differently or write differently or create differently. Um, and that's, like that's what's fun for me that's like i love doing this things like this is is like a hobby that turned into a turned into a shitload of work that turned into a full-time job right like but i love these so so taking you three well just to speak to it it took you three years to put these together i'm sure there's some people listening or that saw you put it i'm I'm, I'll ask you is like there's some people like oh he's just a curator how did how did this take three years right like have i mean have you ever had that conversation because Uh, this takes a long time so much less than I thought, honestly, like when I, the whole time I was working on the Naval book, I was like, I'm going to get shat on so hard, man. So many people are going to be like, all you did was compile quotes and like you didn't add any value and you're just trying to like coat ride. And I got so little of that, honestly, compared to like maybe, maybe two people. Like oh. I was expecting hundreds, like honestly. Right. Um, but to me, that's like, that's a testament to, you can go find, like there's a book of Naval's quotes on Amazon that has like 20 reviews. And it's literally just like barely organized kind of like half-assed like quote compilations. And like the difference between spending 20 hours like collecting quotes and organizing them versus very meticulously like building a mosaic that goes from thread to thread to thread to thread and editing each sentence together and making it feel like this whole big thing is a a hundred times more work. Like there's a thousand plus hours in each of these books. Um, But I'm also like very confident that a lot of value was created in that time because exactly like Jack was talking about, right? Biology is not that accessible for a lot of people, but the ideas are so important. And if we can provide like a little ramp down the rabbit hole, little bait, like dangle a hot dog in front of them, like get them to get them to fall down that rabbit hole. I think that's a lot of good that can come out of that. And especially with this book, man, there's so like, I feel like tech has gotten away from its roots a little bit 
of like true technology, transformative edge of possible shit. We've started to think about it like, oh, tech is software and like tech SaaS. is Google, Google is SaaS and Google Nails and force. companies that are now like decades old and it's full of like MBAs doing B2B SaaS shit. And Horrible. like, no man, tech is tech is like nerdy scientists in cargo pants and like New Balance sneakers like reading papers and hacking on shit and doing things that sound insane and impossible that actually, you know, as, as Balaji said, I made it the first chapter of the book. Cause I think it's one of the most important ideas, like building what money cannot buy today. Like, oh, that's so many, so add, many bangers in there, man. Just hold on a, a second. I need yeah, you let's to, go into that. You, that you, was good. Okay. Hold on. Hold on. <laughs> let's talk about this. I need you, Eric. What does that mean? What did you just say? Repeat okay. it and explain to me what that means. <laughs> the point of a startup is to build what money can't buy. It's to like add a new capability to the human race, right? The point of the startup is not to build a, a marginally better product and like outcompete something that already exists. How about so, a like, thin AI rapper? Is that is that <laughs> B E A I I wasn't gonna say it. How about three pieces of fried chicken instead of two? <laughs> yeah. Wait, okay, this is amazing. Dude, keep going, keep cooking, dude. I love this idea. Wow. So the, the historical version of this, the examples is like in the recent past, like money could not buy an iPhone, money could not buy an internet browser, mm. money could not buy an air conditioner. Like whatever, like we take all the historical versions for granted, but in this moment in time, like money cannot buy a trip to Mars. No amount of money can give us that. No amount of money can generate nuclear fusion uh, at a net positive rate yet. But like um, a, a company we just invested in is a great example, Adam Limbs. They're building non-invasive mind-controlled robotic arm prosthetics. Excuse me? No, nah, that's wild. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> it's fucking crazy. Like, imagine if App Apple built a robotic arm that was like just you put a cuff around a stump, and like you had a robot arm that you could perfectly control with like all the full degrees of freedom of your your natural like human yeah, arm. Yeah, but how would you charge that? How would Apple? Make you <laughs> yeah, charge that? how would you charge that? <laughs> was that, that a, a, some, it all up on adapters? Is that USB C or is that the fire? <laughs> like, uh, which cable are they giving Dude. you, and how much is the accessory? <laughs> Dude, consider consider the accessories. You, you <laughs> cup holder, cup holder oh. on there. Yeah. Little like there we Spider go. Man web shooter in there. Some Wait, hold on. Jorgo, so you cool mentioned uh, you mentioned a couple of investments. Wait, are you when you say you, we? I mean, are you talking about just like your own, like you angel investor? Do you actually have a fund? Uh, I, have a, I have a small fund um, okay, with okay. two partners. Um, okay. We do, we do. I don't know, fifteen, twenty, like kind of small checks a year. It's not it's not okay. a huge huge thing. It's like a scaled up version of our angel investing. Wait, but what's it, the domain? Because it was something dot fun, right? <laughs> yeah, rolling dot fun. Rolling dot. Oh, you got rolling dot fun. That damn dude. That's smart, man. So you probably picked up a bunch of random stragglers that were just seeing what uh, they're looking for the Investopedia article of Rolling yep. Fun. Yep. <laughs> By the way, it's Rolling what is a, Fun. What F-U-N. is a Rolling Fun? No D. Rolling right? Fun. Yeah, yeah no like, D. As in having a fun time. That's all what fun, is a Rolling All beautiful. Fun, no D. What? <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Really, uh, I, I'm not making that joke. I had a really funny joke that I'm not going to make. But, yo, your go. So, uh, man, I love that idea. Uh, uh, so two questions I had was... Uh, so these are taking you just ballpark two to three years to do. And uh, you're you're not going to see that. Here's the thing. Jorgo is not going to go and pay for that version where somebody's talking to 50, 50 hours on somebody inscribed. He's doing it himself. Uh, but uh, and B is, I know that uh, you'd mentioned, I remember when uh, Walter Jackson's uh, Elon Musk book came out. And then like, I think that morning you're like, oh, by the way, I'm also working on an Elon book. But uh, yeah. uh, so is that the next one you're doing? And uh, uh, the, the second question I had is how many of these do you think you can do in your life? How many do you want to do? I So yes, I'm working on an Elon one. Um, I wasn't, I st I'm actually flying through that one because it's a crazy story. My lung collapsed earlier this year and I was just like stuck in bed for like a, a long Christ. time. And all I could do was like, just crank on this book. And it made me feel so much better about not being able to do anything yeah. else in life. So I flew through that. So hopefully this one will take three years again. Um, but yeah, working on Elon. And I think that's a really good progression of like you guys said, sort of, uh, Naval's very like philosophical, strategic. Bology is a little more strategic tactical my elon focus is very like much more tactical like how does elon do what he does like how does he think how does he execute like what's the playbook um so i'm probably i don't know 80 percent of the way through that i got to read that walter isaacson book and like fold that one in 
Um, but I've been through a ton of the Elon stuff already. So like that one's coming along, coming along. You want to throw us a couple of bullet points, some tease us with some learnings. So I think the most underrated thing about him, um, is this, is the combination of like engineering and economics brain that he is like, he is the one man executive, like entire executive team. And so much of the speed that comes out of like SpaceX and Tesla is the fact that like there is no committee conversation consultation happening between like making engineering decisions and making financial decisions. He's got all the information for everything in one brain and he's just like the guy to make all of the decisions. It's uh, like speed and simplicity, I think are his biggest kind of two weapons. Um, but they, to me, they all come out of that is that like, he's got all the variables in one head. And I wish more people, more people tried to do that. Incredible. I love that. That's awesome. You got a, uh, have you got a uh, title for it yet? Are you going to keep the format running? Yeah. The Musk annals of Elon Musk. Musk. The oh. annals. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> love no, I think, I think it's going to be, I think that'll be a special edition cover. Maybe. Um, I think I'm just going to go classic the book of Elon Musk. And like, those will be the three for a minute i'm not i don't think i'm gonna just do like 20 of these my whole career like they people got to earn it like it's got to be it's got to be the right person it's got to be a helpful curation um like i'd love to do paul graham but the essay is already so tight yeah. that like it's not that much value add to kind that of that would like, be you know, the criticism where if you did a paul graham book people are like dude you just yeah. literally took his entire archive because he's <laughs> done yeah like, he's already yeah, he's been very primarily through that yeah he's been yeah. very uh frugal with his outward communication right yeah i mean and he's so careful with those essays and i think they're just probably what he wants them to be i hope i hope he publishes another i mean he did hackers and painters a long time ago i hope he does another compilation someday um but like, i think you know what i do is is probably I would love to, I would love to work with him. I think he's got a ton of us Twitter too. Um, and his stuff is brilliant. I respect him a lot. Um, but yeah, I don't know. There's not a, there's not a ton. I don't know. Maybe, maybe they'll emerge. Um, but I also have a job again, right? Like I got a, I got a company yeah, yeah, to CEO. Yeah. Um, there we go. How many, people work, how many people work at Scribe? Sorry, but 20, I just want to 20, 20 couple. Okay. Nice. And, so, uh, Eric, cause you, go on, go on trunk. Sorry. My no, bad. no, I don't, I don't have a, a hit it, hit it. I was just going to ask because we did we kind of touched on Scribe a few times. We talked about what you do there, uh, and and you kind of how you had used Scribe previously. But could you tell the story of you actually going oh, from yeah, customer dude. essentially to now the person running the show there? Dude, it's a crazy story. So this is like I um I, I know you guys did a, that amazing episode about uh, Ryan Reynolds and like th this whole like intersection between like creator and owner and like creator operator and creator capitalist i i can't stop yeah. thinking about it like seeing people who either are creators start funds or who are funds move backwards into creator like patrick o'shaughnessy like there is so much uh interesting movement like over that threshold between creator and operator and owner and so like i think this is a, i'm sure all of you guys have thought about this a million different ways but as a creator, I was kind of like, how can I make a few really strong relationships with companies that like, I either have a great re like rev share relationship with or own equity in. So like, I don't want to be selling sponsorships on a podcast like every month for the rest of my life. Like that's not a fun way to live. I want to have like a deep relationship with a few companies that I'm a huge believer in and just work on that for a long time. And I think that's what you see with like Huberman. That's what you see with Joe Rogan. That's where like a ton of value actually gets created. Um, that's what you see even Ryan Reynolds or The Rock doing, right? Like build, spinning out their own brands, creating their own companies because they know they have the audience to make them valuable. So that's where my head was in a bunch of different uh, kind of directions. And I love Scribe. I've recommended people, I, you know, when I was just kind of like fumbling my way through the first book and like tweeting about it, Tucker Max, who started Scribe, like reached out, it was a huge help to kind of like mentor me through that process and just give me some confidence and guidance and understand what was coming for me sort of as an author. And so I feel like I owe him and scribe like a ton of, a ton of gratitude for that. And then earlier this year, my buddy, Jimmy Sony, uh, just <laughs> sent me a quick message is like, what? There's like some smoke coming out of scribe. Like what's going on? Like there's some rumors are swirling and, basically the the prior uh leadership sort of ownership i guess um the, the details are fuzzy uh but basically like 
financially just drove off a cliff. Like spending got out of control. There was like, I, I don't know all the details, um, but the bank basically foreclosed on the business. Like they had a loan, that lending bank and the bank was like, uh, they the prior leaders had sort of laid off a ton of people and the bank was like, yo, we're like, we're shutting it down. Um, we, we own this now and started looking for people to buy some of the assets. And I was like, dude, I do not want this company to like fold. Like I love this company. They're critical for me. Like as an author, I love everybody that I worked with there. Let me see if, if I can do anything about it. So I started kind of making some calls to people I know who are in permanent equity and private equity and who buy companies. And one of them, these guys, uh, Sieva and Xavier, who you guys might know, they're pretty big on Twitter. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Great guys. Yeah, okay. yeah. yeah okay, good yeah. dudes. Um, and they got interested. They started kind of doing due diligence and eventually bought some of the assets from the bank and created this new company that has the brand of Scribe. They hired some of the team, kept people working um, and tried their best to kind of clean this thing up a little bit. And then once they were kind of going, they called me and were like, hey, you you brought us this. You're a happy author. Like you think you we've talked, uh, I talked to them a bunch about kind of like where I think publishing is going, what I valued about, you know, what Scribe offered versus traditional publishing. Because for me, like Almanac and Evolve is a life-changing thing and like i want and and tucker helped me get there like i want to offer that to other authors i want to help friends write books i love thinking about this i love working on it like i think books are sacred and so important and high quality books can change people's lives so i thought it was such a cool opportunity to like get a chance to do that for a bunch of other people and they were like yo why don't you come be the ceo of this this thing this like new company that um you know basically bought the scribe brand um, Dude, the alignment is insane. Like, yeah, you it's can't really well, who, think of a more like, alignment. If you were go, yeah, if you were gonna make a short list of people to be CEO, I mean, four of them are on this call. But like, <laughs> for the, <laughs> no, I mean, you're literally on one hand, like the perfect guy to do this. Yeah, I had a ton of the kind of, I mean, the story works. I was excited about it. I'm like. I don't know. I'm fired up about it. And I was like talking to friends. I was like, ah, do I do it? It's so different. Like I, I just, I really got in the groove of writing and like doing all this stuff. And his friends, like you literally just manifested your dream job. Like, how are you not going to just, just shut up and take it? And I was like, but oh, actually, okay. hold on a second. Actually, <laughs> let, let me actually push you on that because you, you're writing, you're creating, this is very different. You're going to start managing people. So, I mean, is this actually something like aside from the mission, how much of a manager are you? Because I actually don't know uh, a ton about your previous professional career. Yeah, so you I worked spent, in startups and stuff before, right? Yeah, I spent like ten years at tech startups okay, before that. Okay, um, okay. So I, I have certainly haven't managed like a company or like a huge team before, um, but I have managed people, and so like this is not totally crazy. Um, it's definitely like RIP to my empty calendar, but uh, it's also like really energizing actually to kind of work with a team again and have coworkers and customers and stuff like that. Like I I'm getting so much energy. I'm two months in now. Oh, like um, you wanted to mix it up a bit. Like you're like, you're just like, I'm ready. Yeah. I'm, I'm psyched. And I think it's a cool, like, it's a cool, uh, kind of, I don't know, undulation to go through in a career to be like, I sprinted in a company for like a long time. Like I was at 10 years at that last startup. And then I basically spent three years kind of solo, like writing, investing, podcasting. And now I'm like operating again. Um, and will be sh for sure for the like foreseeable future. Um, but I'm still going to publish the Elon book. Like I did a huge chunk of work during, during those three years and like this book got done and I'm just publishing it now. The Elon book is almost entirely done um, and it'll come out slowly. So I'll just keep being able to like chip away at that, but it's a great, uh, I don't know. And it's a great overlap, right? Like I get to come talk about the book, talk about scribe, like help other be as an author. It makes me so much better at helping people become authors, like take them through that journey. Yeah, that's amazing, man. Yeah, I'm going to ask a very tactical question, but just in case anyone's ever trying to do something like this in the future and whatever you're happy to share. But I know Xavier and, and that crew, they go and buy companies like similar to probably like Andrew Wilkinson style, I'm assuming. Um, mm -hmm. How do they, you know, how's that conversation go with you? You know, you've got this cool life, empty calendar, doing all these cool projects. Uh, you could get another job in air quotes elsewhere. 
but so they need to come and convince you to a certain point and say, are you excited enough to come and take this over beyond, uh, you know, essentially like the financial upside has to match um, not just financial, but like the upside of taking on the opportunity. There's a lot of opportunity costs. Like how yeah. does that sort of thing usually work? Because I'm assuming a lot of it is equity based that you need to feel ownership of the company and stuff like that. So I'm curious how that conversation yeah. went down. Yeah, I think it totally depends on on the person on both sides, right? It depends on the, the like fund strategy or holding company strategy, whoever the owners are. And it also depends on, you know, what the incoming CEO sort of wants out of the agreement. Like yeah. I think they knew, and I was upfront about the fact that it's like, I don't need a, I don't need a job job. Like I'm not in as for the salary. Like I want to have an impact. I want to this to be a cool company, but also like, I'm not going to do it without meaningful ownership. Yeah. Of course. Um, and like, if you if you want me to do it like that's what that means and if you don't then like no problem like i gotta i got basically a really good batna like i'll go back to writing and be perfectly happy with that um so we ended up in a good spot that that everybody's happy with um but that's gonna vary a ton depending on like you know i'm sure i have a very different agreement than some of the other ceos in their portfolio yeah great trung jack any other questions boys we've covered yeah. a lot here eric thanks a lot I'm for gonna... going for all this I know we're getting close to the end here. I don't want to take too much of Jorgo's time or Jorgi. I know Jorgo is a high school name, but you know, O or Y. No. Oh, the Viking you said, yeah? yeah. The Viking. No, uh, Erica, I'm going to take you back to the frenemy, traditional publishing. Uh, <laughs> do you have a no, book yet, Trump? I do not. I, I do Just not. This, you, you still the screenplay though, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, if I wrote that today, I'd probably get canceled, but... <laughs> At least, least sold it. At least you yeah, sold it. At least you sold it. Got it out of the way. Uh, no, but Jorgo. So the question I had was, uh, yeah, outside of this, you know, people know you for Naval, and now they know you for Balaji, and next year they'll know you for Elon's book. Like, throw some other like uh, tradition, like non, like uh, outside the. Give us three books, three other books, maybe that we wouldn't expect that you to to love and that influence your life that our listeners can Bo- read. Books yeah. that I love. Yeah, just just three books. All right. I love, um, so first of all, like I, I can trace my personality to like authors I read growing up. Right. So like I had a solid thick layer of Calvin and Hobbes from like, I don't know, age like five to eight. Like all I read was Calvin and Hobbes, Bill Watterson. Love it. Still amazing. Um, Roald Dahl, still a huge fan. Ender's Game and like Orson Scott Card, incredible books. Um, On like the nerdy side of things, I picked up poor Charlie's Almanac off my dad's shelf at like 21, changed my life. Just like, oh, your dad had that book. That's respect. Dude, your old He's... man had poor Charlie's. Do you know what writing yeah. threads on Twitter too, man? I'm so, so, like... so lucky. <laughs> Bro, there's like 10 of those That's books incredible. in the world. What Do you mind Seriously. my asking, what's your dad do for a living? Uh, he's a small business owner too. Like, we, I'm, and I, he like, had that respect. book. Damn, Hell dude. Yeah. Yeah, I, I feel very lucky to have like grown up in a house where like entrepreneurship was normal and like we thought about investing. Like the dinner table conversation was like, "Oh shit, payroll is going to be tight," you know. Like, and my grandfather was the same way. He started the businesses. He started a few, I think. My dad ran them for his whole career. Um, so it's a, it's a like I feel very grateful to have that and be able to like pick that book up off the shelf and just be like, oh. This Munger guy's like got it all figured out. I'm gonna read all the stuff he recommends. I'm gonna adopt this life wisdom. And I, like at 24, I went to the Daily Journal meeting, the Berkshire meeting, and stuff like that. And like to this day, some of my closest friends are people that I met there. Because when you see another like dude in his 20s at the Daily Journal meeting, like because he loves Charlie Munger, like you, you guys are gonna have a lot of the same worldview in common. Wait, Eric, didn't you meet Xavier or something at one of those or at one Ber- of those? Berkshire. Berkshire Dude, and Capital Camp. Both, that's amazing. Yeah. Amazing. So wow. obviously Naval Manac was based I mean, that, bro, yeah. all the pieces all coming together. of the puzzle <laughs> yeah. towards the yeah. end of the podcast are coming together. Uh, I love that you said Kelvin and Hobbes, man. I, I've spent a lot of time. I've read, uh, obviously Bill Watson doesn't have a lot of public speeches. His last oh, public appearance was in 1990 at Kenyon College. Um, no kidding. Dude, did yeah. you? So he, he just had a new. Goat, he had a new book come out. Did yeah, you see had, that? Like a more adulty novel, yeah. like the mysteries. Novel, yeah. yeah. So, I, it just I'm came out. I got it. Mine's on the way. Okay. Yeah. Um, dude, that's awesome, man. I got no more cues. Uh, appreciate, it. appreciate every all the time, man. Beautiful, Jack. Anything else, mate? Before we wrap it up here. No. Yeah, Superb. We- Beautiful, no, man, Eric. I'm, I'm... Anything else for us before we kick out, man? This has been great to have you on the day of the launch. It's, it's like. 
yeah, this moment in time. Yeah, yeah. where been, can people get the book? Yeah. That's what we got to finish with. Oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah, I Call mean, the book's, to action. On, the book's on Amazon. <laughs> um, the Audible's come in. Uh, biologyanthology.com has the free versions if you just want to get the PDF. Um, Who's reading the inv- audio book? But, but my of- official investment advice is buy the book because you'll appreciate the ideas in them more than if you mm. read the free version. That's that is true. investment advice. Investment and it's only, advice. right now, it, you sent it to us already for free. I bought my copy this morning. It's only a dollar on Amazon right now on Kindle. So everyone should go do that. But um, yeah, man, mate, when's the Audible one coming out? Do you know? Um, we're still figuring out how we want to do it. There's a bunch of cool options. Um, just need to get Goggins to reading it. You, know, you guys <laughs> you can you imagine that? That's the best collab of all time. You need to get David Goggins Could you to read Balaji's book. Because Goggin do doesn't even read his own now. one. He, he just has the the thing in between chapter. I was so disappointed when I listened. I listened to that book. I, lo- I love his book. But I was so ready just to be pumped up for 10 hours of him just going at it from the book. But in the end, it worked quite well with him in the middle, in between chapters. So I it recommend that book too. We can't hard. be far off the... Uh... AI interpret oh, interpreter for any I'm, voice, dude, right? I'm I'm exploring that um oh, as as a way to publish audiobooks. Actually, there's some really cool tech out there. Um is is, is like some tough interesting decisions to make, but mm-hmm. that is yeah, we are not far from that. Yeah. Um not just voice cloning, but also like instant translations. Like there's yeah, like that's, that's yeah. clone my voice and then turn my read into like my voice Spanish. speaking Chinese or Spanish language. We, like we showed it on the pod a few weeks ago, the Spotify crazy. version of a podcast for that. Yeah. But I've seen since then, I don't think we shared it on the pod, but like even like higher quality than the Spotify version is is pretty wild, man. It's pretty yeah. incredible. Yeah. Like even you know the what? mouth that... seems to move as well in a certain way. Sorry, Jack. I was going to say, yeah, the accent translates and it's just like, it's mental. But I was going to ask, that just gave me the final question. Did you, um, did you, or are you planning on using any uh, AI in the curation process? Or have you like gotten into any mm-hmm. of that stuff yet? I haven't like feeding it out. the Feeding it the beast and seeing what it comes back out with. I played with it. I haven't figured out a reliable way to do it yet. Um, it's just, it's just not like, it's just not quite quality enough and it transforms enough things that you lose a little bit of the voice. Yeah. Um, yeah. so I, I'm, I'm also like, I don't give myself a black belt in AI prompt engineering or anything yet. So I'm not saying it's not possible. Um, just that it hasn't, it hasn't entered this process in a deep way yet, Yeah. Fair um, enough. but we'll get there. Um, I'm I'm deeply grateful to all you dudes for supporting this in a variety of ways. Like Bilal having me on the podcast, Jack doing all the illustrations and stuff and just being so generous with that. Trung throwing some retweets, making me laugh, course, man. keeping me going. Throwing them out there. That's... Appreciate all you guys very much. No, likewise, man. No, it's really cool to see the evolution, bro. So uh, keep it going. We'll be here for the next book and I'm sure a lot more in the future, man. So thanks for coming on. Everyone go check out the book. We'll uh, link to it in the show notes below as well, so you can just click through. And uh, yeah, pick up your biology biology merch from visualizevalue.com. Our kids kids will be pulling Eric Jorgensen books off the shelf. There we go. There we go. (laughs) The virtual shelf by that point, I'm sure. 60 years. When my son's doing the pod, it'll be somebody will ask him, What books did you grow up with? It's like, Did you ever read the Balaji anthology? Beautiful. All right, man. Uh, God well, willing, thanks, everyone. God willing. We'll Cheers. see you guys, guys. Uh, next week. Cheers. Bye-bye. Peace.